All right, if you got your Bibles this morning, we're going to be, um, well, you probably don't need your Bibles, but Matthew chapter 4, I believe. <laughs> keep forgetting. But some of you may want to keep your Bibles and phones, you know. Anyway, we're looking at uh, spiritual warfare, still the series, and stand or fall. We're looking at the third temptation of Christ this morning, but let me just recap the last two temptations. Um, the first one was meeting your needs outside of God's will. In other words, turn the stones into bread, right? So that means that Satan wanted Jesus to do something outside of what God was doing, outside of his will. Meeting your own needs by engineering, orchestrating your ways and means to get your needs done. And that was one of the temptations because at that point, if, if, if Jesus would have succumbed to that temptation, he would no longer have lived by what proceeds out of the mouth of God. And so that's what he came back and said to Satan. Then the second temptation was uh, throw yourself off the pinnacle. And that, that spoke of doing things that test God. In other words, you presume God's going to do something, and so a lot of us have in our lives thrown ourselves off the temple hoping that God will save me. I'm going to go ahead and do this, and hopefully God will bless it. How many have done that? I'm going to go ahead and do this, Lord, and I'm, I'm hoping you'll bless it. Well, you're presuming. You didn't hear. You're presuming. And so um, there's a lot of presumption and um, religious fanaticism. Also, we looked into that being part of throwing yourself off the pinnacle and seeing if God will save you. But today is a very, and also this is a really good um, message this morning, and it sets us up for next week actually. And so next week really kind of brings a lot of this together, so you don't want to miss next week. But this particular temptation, um, keep in mind Jesus is meeting a real person here. This is not just something going on in his head. This is a one-on-one, -on -one, um, hand-to-hand combat with the devil designed to get Jesus to back off from, deviate from, go contrary to what the Father had designed for Jesus, the will of the Lord, the Father, who sent him and for the purpose that the Father sent him. So mankind cannot be redeemed without Jesus, and the enemy knew this. If we can get him to deviate from what God as being the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, then we're not saved. So the enemy has to get Jesus to succumb to these temptations so he can't be the redeemer, the kinsman redeemer. He had to come in flesh and blood. We are in flesh and blood. He chose, Jesus chose flesh and blood, being the kinsman redeemer. He had to be kin to us so he comes in flesh, he comes in blood to be that kinsman redeemer, and the enemy is not wanting that. So Satan lays aside the subtle approach he used in the first two temptations, and in desperation he throws all caution to the wind. He's losing ground, frantic to succeed. He comes to the heart of the matter. Satan wants Jesus to pay him homage, tribute, honor, and service. If only for a moment... He bows down. And we look at that in Matthew chapter 4, verse 9. You look at that on the screen there. Again, the devil takes him up into an exceeding high mountain and shows him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. So this is what happens. He takes him up. And again, whether it was, you know, in a spirit realm or if it actually took place, that's not the point. He takes him up to a high mountain and shows him all the glory of the kingdoms of the world. And um, in return, if Jesus will just show him homage, if he shows him worship, bows down to him, Satan will let him have all of this, all of it. So in return, he'll give to Jesus what Jesus rightfully should possess, all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. Jesus can rule them. Satan promises um, promises him all that is entailed in those kings, and he can only do so side by side with Satan who actually owns them all. Now I want you to look at the next verse. 
And Satan said unto him, All these things will I give thee. Now here's, here's something that you've got to look at. And I'm just going to lay a foundation before we jump into this. Here's something you've got to look at. All these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Now, the thing that, there's, there's a debate going on, and has always been going on, is that was he lying to Jesus? When we know that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, right? The earth belongs to God. So is he lying to him? Because we know Satan's a liar. Can you believe him? Now, does Satan own these kingdoms? Are these kingdoms for him to give? Yes. How 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 did that how did he get this how did he get the kingdoms? Well, number one, what you got to understand, and I know you know this, but we're co going to cover it anyway. Satan came to Adam and Eve in the garden, and there were no kingdoms actually, just what God was doing, the kingdom of God in the Garden of Eden. And so Satan comes at the very beginning and takes that authority. It's like um, a, when you grant someone a deed. God granted the enemy to have possessions of these kingdoms because he got them from Adam and Eve who forfeited over to him. So now Satan gets to, because he gets that the deed of the earth granted to him, if you will, and he gets to begin to start establishing his system. He gets to start establishing his kingdoms. And we'll get more into this hopefully next week. So when he's talking to Jesus, Satan, He's not lying. And I, you know, a lot of people think, no, it's not his. He's lying because I've read several commentaries. And um, however, Luke um, 4, 6, I think that's the next one, if I'm not mistaken. And the devil said unto him, all the power will I give thee and the glory of them that is, that is delivered unto me. <clears throat> See, how was it delivered unto him through Adam and Eve? And to whomever I will, I'll give it. And I'm going to give it to you, Jesus, if you'll bow down and worship me. Okay? So first the devil takes him to a very high mountain to see all the kingdoms of the world. And um, he sees them. Now personally, I don't think the enemy's lying to him because it wouldn't be a temptation if he was lying to him. So if I said to you, I'm going to give you a million dollars if you do something... And you know I don't have a million dollars. Is that a temptation? You'd be like, you ain't got a million dollars. I can't be tempted to jump off of anything or do anything. You don't have a million dollars to give me anyway. So it's a valid temptation if the enemy has the goods to deliver. Right? It, real, it has to be a real temptation or this is just a joke. I mean, is... Well, we'll get into that here a little bit. So anyway, personally, I think this would be a temptation. And Satan's not lying because it's been granted to him. So on three occasions, Jesus described the devil as the ruler of this world. We don't have time to look at this, but John 12, 31, John 14, 30, 16, 11, 2 Corinthians 4, 4. Those verses show that he is the ruler of this world. Satan presently rules the kingdoms of this world, not God. Let that sink in. God rules his kingdom. Satan rules his own. And while God is always God... And he's ultimately rules over all. He has granted the enemy that, that latitude. He allows Satan and evil men to rule until the coming of his kingdom. When their rule will be abolished and his rule be established forever. Matthew 4, 9, as we looked at, if you will fall down and worship me, was the temptation. Falling down in the Middle East um, is a posture known to that culture. For adoration and homage. If this is implied, is homage paid to Satan, but automatically means worship. So that's what we all have. That's what he's wanting is the worship. And the tempter proposes that Jesus shall recognize the worldly power which Satan is allowed to exercise and shall conform his messianic reign into existing conditions by acknowledging Satan's sovereignty. Jesus was in fact to reign over the world yet not as successor or subordinate to Satan, but by utterly overthrowing Satan's kingdom, his dominion. Now, you understand, Satan knows that Jesus, if he does not fall, will rule over him. So he's got to get him to fall like he did Adam and Eve. What did God say to Adam and Eve? You shall have dominion over everything on the earth. That included the devil. 
Many people don't know that, but when he says you will have dominion over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, that included the devil. We talked a lot about this. But they believed the lie. They were deceived. Eve, seduced, Paul says. She was seduced into eating from that tree, thus granting him the deed to the earth where he can establish his rule and reign now. Okay? And so when Jesus comes, Satan knows exactly what this is because this is the promise in Genesis chapter 3. When you put all this together, you always got to start in the garden, but when you put all this together, it makes sense. Satan's kingdom could not be overthrown from the fall of man to the coming of Jesus. And all that time in the Old Testament that you read, man has no power or authority over that dominion. It had been given to Satan. And the, so all that God did in the Old Testament was keep that seed that was prophesied from being destroyed from Genesis to when Jesus was born. And when you understand that, then you, then you realize, wait a minute, the enemy is, because you got to, again, put yourself in the enemy's shoes. You got the kingdom from Adam and Eve. And then you hear God, and then you like to say, what God, what's God going to do? Well, I'm going to give it to you because you got it from deception. They, they willingly gave it to you. And so then Satan hears a prophecy where it says that I'm going, the seed of the woman... The seed of the woman is going to do what? It's going to crush your head, Satan. You'll bruise its heel. That's the crucifixion. But it's going to crush your head, head speaking of authority. So Satan knew he only had a limited time ruling and reigning because his head would, was going to be crushed by a seed of the woman, Jesus. So this seed is born into the world 4,000 years later. The seed comes in. God kept that seed from being destroyed for 4,000 years. That's why everybody's attacking Israel. That's why everybody's attacking them. Because if you can attack and annihilate that race, you've just killed the seed from coming. Right? So if anybody here who's never had a kid yet, and you want to have kids, how do I stop you from having kids? Killing you. If I can kill you, you can't have kids. So if the enemy can stop the seed called Israel, the Jews, if he can stop the seed in the Old Covenant, Christ doesn't come. And so if you see that God is keeping that seed alive through the, through the genealogy and the, and, and the seed being one woman after another woman, one heritage after another heritage until Jesus comes. So now Jesus, Jesus and Satan are going to have it out in the wilderness as Adam and Eve did. They lost. He's going to win over this temptation. But the enemy is desperate. He's got to get Jesus to worship him. Just like he, they, they, Adam and Eve bowed to him, he's got to get Jesus to do the same thing. Does that make sense? All right. So Satan's tempting Jesus with the now. Now here's what you've got to see. This is where this is going to make so much sense to you. He is tempting Jesus with the now. What is the now? You don't got to go to the cross. I'll give you these kingdoms now, they've been delivered unto me. I'll give them whom, to whomever I want. You can bypass the cross and get... You, see, you're going to reign. Your father has promised you to reign over all the kingdoms. Is that right? So, but you've got to go through the cross to get it, Jesus. I have the kingdoms now. Bypass the cross. I offer you the now. You can have it now without the cross. See, that's the temptation. But to get it now, here's what you got to do. In this case, it's bow down and worship me. So he's offering Jesus the now. You can have all these kingdoms without the cross. And Jesus, who spoke the world into existence, was over the world before he came to earth. But having taken on the form of man, entering into humanity, and being in the flesh... If he had taken Satan's offer, would be disobedient to the Father to violate his commitment to the Father who was the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world, choosing to go another way. So once Jesus accepts the commission from God to come down here, he can back out. Because even in a, in a state of weakness, Jesus says, if possible, let this cup pass. But then he went on to say, not my will, but your will be done. If this was not possible, then why the struggle? 
This has to be a real temptation. The cross, the Garden of Gethsemane, have to be a real struggle, which means he could back out. It is possible. If you don't understand this, then you're only seeing Jesus on his divinity side. You're missing him on his humanity side. He could have backed out. You've got to understand, he's 40 days, 40 nights in the wilderness without eating, without being in. He is at his weakest moment right now when the enemy's attacking him. You, can, you guys know as well as I do, the enemy will attack you at your weakest moment. And that's when you make the biggest mistakes is when the heat is on. And that's what's happening here. But he could choose another way. But he says, not my will, but your will be done. However, the good news is that he did overcome for us. He's the victor and he's our vicarious man. Satan comes to us with the same offer. Now listen, he offers us always the now, that which he tempts you with, the easy way, the shortcut. If you just can bypass the cup, God's ways and means and timing, you can have it now. This is where... You, you say, well, what's this temptation got to do with me? I'm not going to go to the cross. I don't have an opportunity of having a kingdom. It's not the same. Yes, it is exactly the same. Who's going to rule and reign with Jesus? Are. You are. He's the one who goes before us. He's the one who gets the victory, and he's going to share the spoils with us, which is the kingdoms of this world. Because it says that in, in the other world, when we get to the... Whatever that looks like, it says that we'll reign over ten cities, five cities, however many cities, due to the rewards and stewardship and faithfulness on this end. It sets us up for some type of ruling and reigning on the other end. And so we're going to be ruling and reigning beside of him. And how do you get ten cities? So you never hear the church talk about rewards. We rarely ever talk about the rewards. We want to talk about, well, if I do this, I get that now. We're always wanting to talk, we're always leading the church about talking about the temporal. But we never prepare the church for eternity, where there will be rewards and where you have placement by your faithfulness on this end. You understand that? Yeah. So Satan is going to offer you the now of what you can have now than waiting for God to do it in his timing. Satan's going to offer you the now rather than go through the hell that you got to go to get. He said, through much tribulation, we what? We inherit the kingdom. Through much perseverance, you inherit. You inherit the kingdom. And Satan's going to come to you every single time and offer you an easy way out. Yeah, you can dig in and wait for God and go through hell to get there, but if you go this route... You can have it now. We talked a little bit about this after, our, after the teaching Thursday about the Ishmaels. Rather than wait for Isaac, I can have it now. The now is the tent with Hagar. And, he, and his wife tempted him with the now. Rather than waiting for what God was going to do. See, this is what Satan is doing with Jesus. You don't got to go the way of the cross. That's a hard way to go, Jesus. I know God's got your life mapped out, and it's, it's, it's a hard way. Do you know why it's a hard way? Do you know why your life is, the, the, the path that God has marked out for you is hard? Because you're in the devil's territory. Now, if we were in utopia, and this was heaven, then it wouldn't be a hard way, would it? Who do you think is making your way hard? You know, you cry out to God and you go, man, can it get any worse? Well, hell yeah, it can get any worse. You sure it will. And it probably will. You obviously, don't, you obviously don't believe in the devil if you say to God, can it get any worse than this? Come on, God, give me a break. Get him give you a break? He's not the one creating it to be as hard as it is. Satan has designed his henchmen, if you will, and you are allotted a, a group of his fallen angels to make your way hard. And because he makes that way hard, he offers you the easy way out. Because the way that God has, it's like, here's, you can go A, you can, you, can go, you can go to the right, you can go to the left. Now, left is easy. Satan won't bother you. He'll make it an easy path. In fact, he'll pave the way for you. But God's way, to do it his will, to do it the way he wants, it's not paved. It's going to have all kinds of crazy terrain that you got to jump over, step over, fall down, rocks, all kinds of stuff. And you're like, man, I'm not up for this. 
But that's the way God has designed for you to go. And the enemy's made that way hard. But God says, this is the path. Walk in it. Right? And so you have to understand, this is what Jesus was being offered. This was the temptation. You can skip the cross. Now, what's Jesus' response? Jesus overcame the temptation with two final words. The first one of stern rebuke, verse 10. Then one of total commitment, verse 10. He spoke the rebuke forcefully and, and, and vocally to Satan and says, Be gone, Satan. I think the King James says, Get thee hence. And the Philip says, uh, Away with you, Satan. And the victory is achieved. The second Adam has not fallen and will not fall. For it stands for... It stands written, our Lord wields his favorite weapon. It is the sword of his, the sword of his mouth, to the, which is the sword of the Spirit. So he's speaking the word over again and again. It is written. It is written. Jesus' word of commitment. It is written. You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Later when Jesus asked, which is the greatest commandment, he's going to answer, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. With all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. Matthew 20, verses 37 30. Do I have that one? No. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so um, the devil leaves him at that point. Now look at verse 11. Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and serve him only. And shall serve him only. Now, when you see this, what's he doing? He's this is how you fight the devil. We've already talked about this. You stand against the devil with the word. That's the sword of the spirit. You stand, and that's what he did. He stood in the temptation, being offered what he did. He stood his ground, and the devil left him. Luke adds his own unique ending to this temptation account in chapter 4, verse 13. We have that one? For, for the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him next now, when the devil had ended every temptation, now watch this, he departed from him until an opportune time. That means he's going to come again through another angle, hit him again, and as I said millions of times, you should know this by now, in the literal Greek, that means that the enemy backed off like a boxer waiting for another opening to hit him. And so he had a reprieve there, but he's going to get hit again. We have our reprieves. We'll go through a battle, and then we stand our ground, and then the enemy backs off, and he waits for another opportune time in your life. It's never going to stop. Well, I, I, would, I mean, you, I thought maybe there would be like a, 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 a quota of temptations I'd get, and then once I proved myself, they'd all stop. No. Do you, this goes on forever because the enemy will never stop trying to steal kill and destroy it's never going to stop all right in every possible way that satan could think of he has sold jesus without avail so he departed then vanquished for not for not for good again and again he renewed his attacks on jesus on, in subtle occasions and there there are scriptures there and he even used his own disciple peter to do it Satan's going to come at you through every ways and means. We've talked about this, the weakest link. He's going to look for the people in your life he can use against you. And we're never ready for this. We're never ready for this. And we're always taken off guard. And Peter said, be on the what? Hmm? See? Be on the guard. Be on alert. Be on alert. <clears throat> the devil is a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. So are we on the alert? We get shocked. Oh my God, so and so is against me now. Well, it shouldn't bother. It, yeah, that happens. I mean, as, as we, we wake up every morning as if the devil's sleeping in or he's on vacation. We just get lulled to sleep because we're not being taught this revelation of, of spiritual warfare that every day he's going to come against us. But at the same time, we also have to preach, we're the victor. He's not going to win. These are all futile attacks if you rest in Jesus' finished work. And his. I mean, here's the bottom line. I don't have to go against the devil. Jesus already did. 
But that doesn't stop him from coming against you. I'm not out there looking to get into fights with him. I'm looking to do the will of God, be led by the Spirit, walk in the Spirit. He's going to automatically come, and I'm going to stay focused and set my face like a flint toward what God is saying and doing in my life. And then when he shows up to make my way hard, I just rest even more. In my weakness, we talk Thursday, in my weakness, he keeps making himself strong. And Jesus is, is coming against those temptations in my life. I can't. Right? He already overcame him. So he comes inside of me to continue to overcome him. And that's why I have to rest in Jesus. Because if I don't, he'll get the best of me. Now let me ask you this. Has <clears throat> Satan ever got the best of you? You know that's true. Yeah. So this is not something that we're just blowing smoke about. This is real stuff. Every day he's coming at you with temptation. To make your way hard. To get you to fall. To, and, and, and looking at this third temptation to give you the opportunity to have something now rather than waiting for what God has. All right? Now, I want to, the closing's a little long, so um, let's go there. Here's where I, this is really that all that was just fill in. Let me, let me get to the heart of the message right now. Adam and Eve fell by listening to the words of Satan in the Garden of Eden. They chose to go another way. The same temptation to break rank with God and choose another path. Now, let that sink in. They chose another way. One that's more pleasurable, delightful to the eyes. But Jesus, the last Adam, meets the devil head on, one on one. He tempts him first with meeting his own needs outside the ways and means of God. And the second temptation was to get him into presumption and test God. And the final temptation, appealing to his pride by offering him rulership. Okay? Now go to Mark 10, 35. He's offering Jesus a shortcut. He's offering Jesus a way out. Now watch this. You ready for this? James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to Jesus. These are two of his disciples. These are called the sons of thunder. These are the two guys that wanted to rain down fire from heaven. They came to Jesus and said, Teacher, we want you to do something for us. Whatever we ask of you. I have to throw this in. There's a scripture that says, Whatever you ask the Father in my name, I'll do it. Right? If you ask anything in my name, I'll do it. Right. All right. Well, they heard that. But they're going to ask him for something. Lord, you said if we ask anything in your name, you would do it. So does that give you and I a carte blanche to ask God for anything we want and he'll do it? Well, we're going to find out right here. Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Because that's what you said in John chapter 14. Whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, what do you want me to do for you? They said to him, grant that we may sit one on your right and one on your left in your glory. Next. But Jesus said to them, you do not know what you are asking. Now, does that sound like they're going to get what they want? No. Sounds like to me they don't know what they're asking. So don't be so quick to ask God for anything because you may not know what you're asking. Right? Are you able? Now watch this. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? I should have underlined that. Drink the cup that I drink. What's he talking about? Is that a literal cup? We're going to pass the cup? Or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized. And they said to him, we are. We're able. And Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you shall drink. It's coming, whether you like it or not. And you shall be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized. But to sit on my right or on my left, this is not mine to give but it is for those whom it has been prepared. So they're not going to get what they want. But that's not the point, although that's something you need to consider. So you're not going to get, he's not going to do anything you ask, because right there's a pretty good, well, you know, I did say whatever you ask in my name, I'll do it. I guess I'll have to, nope. 
It still has to do with what God has called you to and raised you for. You're not going to get out of that called cup. So the cup is not your literal cross, because that's what Jesus died on, and you died with him on that cross 2,000 years ago. But there is a metaphor of cross or cup, which is the destiny and purpose and plan that God has for you that has a cost. Jesus said, count the cost. You can also throw in, if you, you know, take up your cross and follow me, deny yourself. Deny what the devil... See, Adam and Eve, there's they. No one made them. They chose to sin. Their self chose to sin without a sin nature. Every day you're tempted to choose from who you are as a person without a sin nature, but still falling and still sinning because of the lies, deceptions, and temptations of the devil. So you, as Jesus, Adam and Eve fell, Jesus overcame, you and I, we come, sometimes we win, sometimes we lose. But every time the temptation comes, whatever it is, is to get us to choose outside of Christ another way. And so then you did not deny yourself from what's pleasurable to your eyes. Rather than rest in what God has for you, you chose to go another way. And that's when you succumb to temptation. Does that make sense? Yes. yes. All right. So they chose another way. Jesus wouldn't. Now, Satan is the power of the air, the prince of this world. All we can do, now listen to this, give me some stuff here. All we can do at this point is break his hold on people and territory. People, individuals, we can break the hold. You can break the hold of the devil in your life. It's all, actually, it's already been broken 2,000 years ago. You just got to know that and then enforce that. Or you can see somebody else in your life that may be under the enemy, oppression of the enemy. You can break that for them by praying for them, laying hands on them, maybe casting something out of them if necessary. Um, so in that respect, we can only do two things. Break the hold of the enemy on, on people, individuals, and over territories. Now, a lot of people debate the territory, but when you look at the Old Testament, and if, if, I, can, if I can get this right, um, the, first, the, the first kingdom was Babylon, and that's the one Daniel was under, all right? And there's a prince over that territory. While they're under Babylonian captivity, in other words, that prince brought them into captivity, God allowing it. And then they're told about the prince of um, Persia. Remember that? Yeah. The prince of Persia. Now the prince of Persia that they overcame is going to be the one that overcomes that. So once the prince of Persia is overcome, then there's going to be another one. And it's the prince of Greece. This is the one Alexander the Great comes out of. And Israel has to endure all this. So is this, it's a, this is a territory, is it not? This is a territory. This is the one that's going to deliver them out of the Babylonian captivity and send them back. While that's going on, there's a prince of Greece, Greece the Grecian prince. And then out of that, Jesus comes and Rome is in control. These are territories. These are territorial spirits. It's controlling the atmosphere while... Israel is existing. So that Jesus comes, they're under Rome occupation. No more Babylon, Persia, Greece. They're under Rome. And every principality that's taken out, another one comes. Taken out, another one comes. Taken out, another one comes. And so what you have in happening in the United States, whether you want to believe it or not, and we're talking territory, is that if the enemy can control the territory, that's the first, then he controls the people. And remember when we talked about principalities and powers. How does he control the people? He controls the territory with principalities, mindsets. That's why every there's a mindset to the Middle East. There's a culture. You, you say it's a culture. But that culture is a result of strongholds and mindsets. Then you go over to the European. The Europeans are totally different from the Middle East. Would you agree with that? 
would you also agree that the Asians are different from the Middle East? The Asians are nothing like those that are in Europe. There's, there's, and you know, or Africa, every, or, or, or South America, every one of these continents has a territorial spirit that's calling the shots, called blinding the people, setting them up with mindsets, and that's why they all have different mindsets. Some are very humble, some are very violent, some are very snobbish, and you put them all together in America called a melting pot, and you got a lot of chaos. Because they're of different races, different cultures, different mindsets. Because they are a result of territorial spirits who created these principalities and powers that the territorial spirits control the atmosphere and create these mindsets called culture. And right now America is heavily under attack by your media. Whether you want to believe that, if, if not, you mean to tell me the devil's not going to use the media against you? Wow, you're smarter than him. Okay, take the media out. Take the government out. How's he going to, how's he going to, territorially, how's he going to control you? If, you're not, if you don't think it's the government and you don't think it's the media, who, who's left that's got a voice called deception? Tell me who's left. Church needs to wake up. <clears throat> okay, so does the United, the United States has territorial spirits? States? You think West Virginia is a depressed, impoverished state versus other states? Hmm? What makes this state the way that it is versus what makes a state? Why is New York and California so crazy in what they're doing governmentally, administrative-wise, to the people, the policies? Why is that different from what we do? It's a spirit. Why? Why? Come on. Why is the Michigan governor more tyrannical than our governor? You got little Jimmy there, and you got little Gretchen over there. They ain't the same people, folks. Somebody's, somebody's pulling strings. Someone's pulling strings. Someone's getting delusional. Someone's getting blinded. Someone's being used for the purposes of what the devil wants to do. And we just sit there and think, well, she's just a mean person, and he's a nice person. You think that's, that's it? You think that's it? We are blind to the enemy. Principal, you do, do you believe that we are wrestling principalities and powers? And if it's not those in positions over you, then who is it? Your boss is a principality and power. If he's not on board with what's going on. He can be against you. Someone working right next to you can be a principality and power. Now, no one, no one disagrees with that. I work with this person, and he or she's demon-possessed. She's nuts. And we're like, yeah, I've worked alongside people that's the same way. But if I want to take it a little higher to a mayor, to a governor, oh, now you're getting political. So how do I go, how can I, how can I agree that this woman working next to me is nuts and used by the devil but not my mayor or not my governor or my president? How can I can't take it to that level? You better because there's an antichrist supposedly coming who's going to be a one world ruler and you think who you think's calling his shot? Who you think he's the puppet master of? So, where's the stop? You've got to believe in what we're talking about. Prince, we wrestle not against flesh and blood individually, but God in Christ has set us free from the domain of the devil. You can be working beside someone who's possessed to some degree or obsessed, but there, by the way, there's no such thing as possession and obsession in the Bible. It's just one Greek word called demonized. So let's just call it for what it is. You may be sitting next to someone who's demonized. You want to use possession? Fine. I'm just telling you, it's not, it's not a biblical word. or It's demonized. So you may be sitting beside someone, beside someone who's demonized, working along somebody who's demonized. They got, they, they got nothing on you. You are greater is he that is in you Amen. than he that is in that world. Amen. I ain't quitting my job because of this, that, or the other. And thus God tells me to. If he moves me, I'll go. But they ain't moving me. Satan's not moving me. W wouldn't that be the thing to do if you were the enemy? If you, if you were doing the will of God 
and you're where God wants you, and now you've got opposition. That's why I try to tell some people that I know personally. I said, look, you, you, every time there's hardship at a job, you quit and because you want to go somewhere else. That person made you quit. Really? I thought we weren't wrestling flesh and blood. You got it. That person's designed to teach you who you are. Remember we talked about this Thursday. The potential of Christ in you. You don't know that, but that person's going to create a crisis in your life so that they don't overcome you. You overcome the spirit that's on that person. Or a territory. Well, do you really care about territory? I mean, we're talking about different continents. Does that... You're going to go up against a world ruler? Cosmocrotorus in the Greek? You're going to go up against that? Probably not. But... Do you think that your house is a territory? Hmm? You don't think the devil doesn't want to put a stronghold in your own home and make you a miserable wreck? His whole thing's designed. He comes at you in your job. He comes at you at work. He comes at your job, your work. He comes at you at your house, in your family. He is going to choose and look for those in your life that he could call weakest links and get them to attack you. And then you're just going to see it as, well, they're just mean. No, it's a spirit. It's a, it's a warfare. And, the, and, and this is just how it is. Now, didn't want to get too much into that. So let's close. The three temptations Satan tried with Jesus, he continues with us. And what is that? Offers you the now and not wait for God. This is huge. Every single one of you, whether you want to believe this or not, you were raised with an inheritance. And the inheritance is all kinds of things. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, God did not call you to calamity, but to give you a future hope. NIV says prosperity. He said, I didn't raise you for calamity. And Jeremiah goes on to say that God's out to do us good. God's not out to do us bad. That's what the devil does. The devil's out to do us bad. God's out to do us good. So you got good coming at you called blessing, and you got bad coming at you called curse. And they're both coming at you. And you're the victor. Supposedly, you, you, you ought to know that so that you don't succumb to the curses, the temptations, the sin, and everything. And then you'd go, you don't go the other way. So let's say God's got all this mapped out for you. He's got blessing. He's got destiny. He's got, he's got everything you need in life. He's got everything you need. Jobs. Houses, mates, all this is good, is it not? Any tra cars, transportation, clothing, food. He says all that your Heavenly Father knows you have need of. So it's all designed, already given, already done. And it's going to be meted out to you as you go along in life when you need it. He said he'll, he provides for the birds, he's going to provide for you. So you have this thing called inheritance. But it doesn't come easy, and it doesn't come overnight. And sometimes, if you, how many have had dreams that God has given you, prophetic words God has given you, um, promises that you know God has personally given you? You think they come easy? You know why they come so hard? Because the devil is designed his schemes and methods to stop you from that. So you don't get it. He's going to make it hard. But while he's making it hard... Remember the old saying, don't watch, watch what this hand is doing, not this one. So if I can get you to do, watch this hand, I'm doing something with this hand, right? He, he's, he's got both hands coming at you. He want, he's making it hard, and at the same time he's making it hard, right? How many been in hard crisis where well, you're weak like Jesus, 40 days, 40 nights, man. You are very vulnerable. You have, you're waiting for this thing and waiting and waiting. And the more you wait, the more vulnerable, the more weak you are, the more harder it gets. And he's creating the hardness. But at the same time, he's creating the hardness. He's also offering you an easy way out. Don't wait for that. Here, this is better. This is now. And you're like, well, maybe I'll just go this way. You try to justify it. But are you going to drink from the cup that God has given you called what he's designed for you in life? He told those guys, are you able to drink from the cup? Are you able to go the way that I'm going to go? And the way that Jesus went is called cross. 
And the way you or I are going to go is cross, counting the cost of what it means to be a disciple. And every step along the way, Satan's going to offer you an easy way out every time. If you're in business, he's going to offer you an easy way versus a hard way. No, I'm going to wait. I'm going to do what's right. I've got principles. I've got values. I'm living by the word of God. Yes, but doing that gets you in trouble and you may not get what you... But over here, if you just do this, do that, here's the easy way. You can bypass the cost of discipleship and get it this way. You can go ahead and do a church growth techniques and grow your church overnight, or you can wait for God to do it His way. Huh? We could easily have this church double within a month by certain techniques. Well, then why don't you do it? Because He didn't say that's the easy way out. That's, that's the easy way out. Can I be honest? You see, you're not going to hear this from God. See, every pastor wants... Want, they want to double their church, so they go out there and do whatever you, whatever it takes, do it. I don't have a whatever it takes mentality, because I live what proceeds out of the mouth of God, not whatever it takes. So can I be honest? I don't want everybody in this church. There are people I do not want in this church. I don't want the people God doesn't bring here, because they're the troublemakers, and they're eventually going to go. You don't believe that, do you? Can I tell you a quick story since we've we, we're, we're, we got time for this? This is comical. I'm not going to take the easy way out in this church, and neither should you in your own personal life. We go God's way. It may take longer. It may be harder, but it's God's way. He's the one doing it, not me. So I, when I started this church in 98, we probably had about this many people. And I said... I want, to, I want to teach you guys something. So I said, let's just go around, who, who, you know, and I asked people, um, why are you here in this church? Why are you here in this church? And I know what I'm looking for. I know the answer. I'm going to teach it to them. But I thought, well, maybe someone will have the, the right answer. Don't, no, no. So one lady raised her hand. She says, well, my mother goes to church here. I'm like, I'm in trouble. That's not what we're looking I'm like, okay. So let me ask you, should you go to a church because that's where your mama goes? Hmm? Well, my fa my now, yeah. stop. <laughs> my family's gone to this church. That's why. Is that why you go to that particular? So I'm, I'm like, okay. I didn't say nothing. I just said, okay, next. And um, I had some, I, I'm going to get to the, the, the one. I'm going I'm to cut to the chase here. The one that got me was, it's the closest to my house. <laughs> she lived right up the street. I'm like, oh my God, help me. So I said, look, I get it. But here's why you come to this church. God told you. If you come to this church because of something that's good, you'll leave because of something that's bad. There's always something to find wrong. So... I don't know how to take that, Diane. <laughs> <laughs> no, not, not the bad one. Yeah. But, so, but if I do good, I don't break. Praise God. If I do bad, God forgive me. But I'm here because this, this is where God led me. That's the only reason to be here. So I don't want to go out there and bring people here because I offered them some hope that you, know, you can find Jesus and you can have your rent paid if you come to my church. God will give you a new car if you come to my church. God will heal you of cancer if you come to my church. Oh, God will just bless you if you just get saved and come to my church. Do you know how many people who are, will, will be coming for the wrong reason? And then if God doesn't fulfill like these guys, He didn't give them what they wanted, and you bring people here by dangling hope that God's not going to do, then they're going to get frustrated and take it out on you, which they should because you told them God would do this and that and the other if you just get saved and come to my church. I don't want I, I, I don't want everybody, I only want those here. You say, well, prove that biblically. They go to Jesus and they said, Do you realize what you said offended that group of people? Now, any pastor would say, Well, let's go make it right. Let me go apologize. What do I need to do? He says to them, Whom my heavenly father did not plant, he will uproot. Now, so God's uprooting people. God's planting people. So if God uproots somebody here, we just bless them. Yeah, you might find it better 
somewhere else. If this is, if I'm not the, if I'm not the oracle that you're hearing that's giving you liberation and truth and freedom, then you can find it somewhere else. It's fine, and God will uproot you to go somewhere else. So I'm not, and I said all that to say, I'm not looking for the easy way to grow this church. I'm looking for God's way. And it takes time, it takes waiting, it takes faith, it takes trust, and I'm not going to do some technique to get a, to get an, a result. That's what Jesus was doing, or Satan was doing to Jesus. Don't go the way to the cross. You can have it now. Don't wait for God to give you the promise. You can have it with this person now or with that job now. Don't wait for the right car. I got one for you right here. Don't wait for the right house. There's several over there in that community that you, where you want to live at you can have. We're always now, give it to me, got to have it, and waiting on God is like this curse. But... Do you want to go the way of God? Or do you want it now? There's a lot of things I want now, honestly. That's my contention with God a lot is I am tired of waiting. I want it now. And the devil hears that. And so here comes counterfeits. Here comes Ishmael's. Here comes something that God's not doing. Here's, here comes something God's not saying. And you get sometimes you get upside down in the thing because... You, like Jesus, 40 days and 40 nights of fasting, not you, but 40 days, 40 years of waiting for something? You're going to tell me you're not going to be weak to take a now if you've been waiting 40 years for something? You're not going to be tempted to take the now that Satan offers you, or can you go another, another year? You've all heard back in the day when uh, Arizona, they're all going out west to strike gold. And you've always, you hear these stories where these guys would mine out a vein, and, or they're looking for a vein. And they're like, they got, their, they got their own plot, they're digging, been there for a year, and they're like, I'm done, there ain't nothing here. And then the guy comes a month, three months later, starts, boom, there was the vein. They stopped two inches short of the vein that became a millionaire. How many, how many have heard that? Yeah. These people, I mean, a year, two years, I, I, I can't do anymore. And they walk out, and just another hit, there's the vein of gold. Don't be like that. Wait for God's promises. Wait for God's plan. Don't sell out to the now. And I'll give you a perfect story for that. Esau is the older brother to who? Isaac. Jacob. Jacob. Man, you're batting a thousand. You do realize that, don't you? <laughs> and, um, but the birthright goes to the older son. Always. But in this case, God says when they were born, the, um, the younger will be over the older. In other words, the older will serve the younger. So Jacob is going to try it. He doesn't need to do this because God already ordained him to have it, right or wrong. Right. He doesn't need to be the trickster his name means, Jacob. And so he's going to trick his brother Esau out of the birthright. How's he do it? Food. Soup. Right? Right. So if Esau comes home, he's famished. And he's sitting there and he's hungry. And Jacob is making soup. Esau's been out hunting all day. He didn't bring anything home. He's hungry. He's now watch weakness. He's hungry. Hasn't ate and he's frustrated. He didn't kill anything. He'd been out there all day, didn't get nothing. So he's mad, he's frustrated, on top of that he's tired and hungry, and he smells the soup. And he says, Jacob, won't you give me a cup of that soup, man? I'm dying over here. He said, okay, but give me your birthright. Give me your birthright, and I'll, I'll give you the soup. Now, birthright means he gets like 90% of the blessing and the inheritance of the Father. So this is a huge thing. Birthright's a huge thing. And what does Esau say? What, what, what good is this birthright doing to me? I'm dying here. Sure, we'll make the swap. He took the now, then wait. And that's why in Hebrews, he's called that profane man Esau, who sold his birthright for some soup. What are you selling out for the now? 
when God says, hold on, I've got something coming. Huh? Nah, I'm hungry. I've got to have it now. I'm really frustrated, Lord. I've waited for so I, I Right there it is. I can have it now this way. No thought. And, and you may not even be saved, but you just trying to justify it. Well, Lord, maybe this is the one. Maybe this is what you're doing. Maybe this is what you're saying. And you know that it's not because what you've been holding on to. And what happens is, now listen, we end up settling. And we do not get God's best. And when we settle for less than God's best, we sell out. And Esau is a perfect example. And Paul in the New Covenant called him profane. He sold his birthright for the now. Don't sell out your, your calling. Don't sell out the purposes and plans of God that he has for you. Don't sell out. Wait. Wait for it. It's going to be hard. That's why the warfare. And we're going to talk about this next week. Um, so I really gave you a lot of next week at the end here. But listen, why spiritual warfare? Why is it so hard? Why is life so hard? Why is it so tough? Why is it every time I turn around I'm getting hit here, there? It, things are coming so hard. Folks, next week I'm going to give you the answer to that. And it's going to encourage you. It's going to, it's going to set a new chart for your life. I'm telling you. It has me. And I'm like, I, he showed me, I was mowing grass yesterday, and I'm mowing grass, and I get down like, oh my God, I really wanted to stop mowing grass and go get on and, and, and write all this stuff out before I forget it. But, um, but I didn't forget it, so I wrote it all out, and it's our sermon for next week. All right, so let's not sell out. Let's not do that. Let's wait for what God has. Let's not sell, because when we sell out, we bow to the enemy of what he's offering us. That's what he wants. He wants you to bow to what he can offer you now rather than wait for what God has for you later. Amen. Heavenly Father, we bless you. We thank you that you have, you've ordained a life of best. You have ordained for us a life of best. You've given us a future. Jeremiah 29, 11, you've given us a future and a hope. Plans of welfare. Plans of prosperity. You're out to do us good. Jeremiah is saying all that. You're out to do us good with a life of prosperity and blessing. Because Jesus has paid it all. Jesus didn't, get, Jesus didn't rise from the dead to give us curses and thorns and thistles. That's the enemy. He's raised us to newness of life. He's raised us for abundant life. He's raised us for prosperity and success. Maybe not the prosperity and success your carnal mind may be thinking of, your unrenewed mind. But what, what is prosperity and success? You getting everything you were raised for. You are raised for an inheritance, and you have it. And the enemy is going to do everything he can to keep you from experiencing the glory of God, the best of God, that which Jesus died for. Let's not sell out our inheritance for the now. Thank you, Lord. We'll wait it out. The waiting can be the warfare as well. Standing our ground and waiting for the victory, waiting for the manifestation of my inheritance in this day, in this time, in this hour. And the enemy's going to come and throw everything at you plus the kitchen sink. But you've got to have an understanding that no, you are raised for more than what the enemy's offering. You're raised for more than just buckling under pressure. I'm not going to fall. I'm going to stand until I receive all that God has for me. What he raised me for in this life. I'm not going to settle for the now. I'll wait for his best that may come later. I want it from God, not what the world, the flesh, and the devil can offer me. So let me close with this. You say, well, how do I know the difference? He will disturb your peace. You'll look at the now, and your flesh will want it, your mind, whatever you want to call it, the, the, the enemy's dangling in front of you. You'll have impulses, 
to want it, but there'll be a disturbance in your spirit. It's like, wow. Not a big disturbance. Sometimes it will be. But it'll be a little check in your spirit. Like, I don't, I don't have faith for this. I, 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 can't, I can't take that job. I, I, I can't take that job. I'm not buying that car. I know you want to give me a good deal on it. I know that you're cutting it 2000 under the sale price. I get what you want. Uh, you give me a great interest, interest rate. I, I can't go there. I don't know why. And on paper, I ought to go there. On paper, yes. But in my spirit, I can't go there. I can't do it. And you, you're going to be ridiculed. You'll get hated by people. You'll be ridiculed by people. But I don't, I, I'm sorry. I got to do what Christ is doing in me. And I can't do anything other than that. And you can't fault me for that. You wouldn't want me to go out there and make this church grow because someone gave me a book. You can't fault me for saying no to techniques. Let's do it God's way. Let's have a supernatural move of God in this place. Don't you want a supernatural move? In, I mean, where is the supernatural move of God anymore? You realize you can have almost anything you want in life if you just tweak a certain few things, you can have it. That ain't God. That's you engineering and orchestrating in other ways and means. I'm done with that. I want a move of God. I want a glorious unveiling of His power, of His glory in my life, in this church, and in your life, and your, in what, come on. I just don't want to tweak this. They keep tweaking and tweaking and tweaking and tweaking. I, I want a move of God. I want a glorious God opening up the heaven and pouring out blessing I'm not able to contain. That's, that, that's what I'm waiting for. How about you? So let's not be like Esau and sell out. Let's hold on, stand, having done all, stand and stand and stand as God keeps giving us our inheritance. And we will not sell out for the now. Amen? God bless you. See you Thursday night.